Welcome back, my friends. Today's video, we're going to do another dedicated question and answer. Once a month on the community tab, my YouTube channel, I'll put out a question prompt such as this one. This month, I used a picture of Patron, the bomb sniffing dog. And down below, you can ask me any question about anything, read each other's questions, and upvote the questions you want me to respond to. Lots of great questions this month, but the cutoff was. 70 thumbs up. Uh, so let's get to as many as I can get to. So the most upvoted question was from Harmon, and he asks, how serious should we take the rumors of Wagner forces being active in Belarus, practically taking over the Belarus army and staging all kinds of covert operations towards Poland? My opinion is this is really a non-factor. Wagner is fighting to remain relevant. Pergosian is going to make noise. They want to grab headlines for provocations. But are they actually militarily going to do anything? And I argue no. And this is the official position of the White House. The Wagner group poses no direct threat to NATO. Yes, if there was a unfortunate incident, maybe some Polish farmers might be victims, but... As far as a real military threat to Poland or Lithuania or anyone in the area, I argue no. One, the Belarus military is pretty silly. They put out these propaganda videos trying to look tough, but this really is the best they got. Their military uh, is, is not that impressive. So to begin with, Belarus is a very impoverished country, a population of only 9. 3 million people. If it was, you know, the Manhattan Police Department versus the Army of Belarus, I probably would put my money on the Manhattan Police Department. <laughs> Look at the annual expenditures that Belarus spends on their military. It's not even 1 billion US dollars annually. Sometimes uh, it averages uh, 500 million dollars. So every time the United States sends a security assistance package to Ukraine, it's usually around $500 million to $1 billion. Every time the United States, every week or two, they send an, ass an assistance package larger than the annual expenditure of Belarus's entire military. So both the military of Belarus and the Wagner Group depend on the generosity of the Kremlin for all of their fuel and all of their military supplies. And at the moment, Russia's fighting a war and losing, so they don't have helicopters and tanks and artillery shells to spare for the Wagner Group or the Belarus military. So they're going to continue trying to draw attention. Uh, that costs them nothing. But as far as a real military threat, I argue they're a non-factor. Next question, are there any new indications on for how long Russia could continue financing their war? Are the sanctions still hurt, hurting their economy and defense industry? Or has Russia found alternative ways? Could the Russian economy collapse sooner than Ukraine would be able to win militarily? I've argued on my channel that this is going to happen at the same time. I don't think Ukraine can militarily defeat Russia as long as Russia's economy is still standing. Uh, Russia's economy is going to collapse, which is going to trigger a political collapse, which is going to trigger a military collapse. And a YouTuber who does a much better job than me talking about Russia's finances is Joe Bloggs. I'll give him a shout out if you want to check in on some of his recent videos. He updates regularly about the Russian economy. And I don't really know what the truth is. I know over the winter months, Russia was reporting themselves that they were operating monthly budget deficits, meaning for that month they spent more money than they brought in in tax revenue. Most of their tax revenue coming from the state agencies that operate their oil and gas fields. But according to this article, they had a budget surplus in May. Is it real? I, I don't know. 
Russia started this war with $600 billion saved up in international reserves. So they were holding yen, they were holding dollars, they were holding euros. And Putin didn't tell his financial advisors he was launching this war. Otherwise, they would have pulled all this money back to Russian banks. But about half of it was frozen when Russia launched their invasion. So they really started this war with only $300 billion in foreign reserves. Nobody is going to loan Russia money. So how long can they last on this money? And if you just think about it, if they operate a monthly budget deficit of only a billion dollars, then they can go for 300 months. It's not as simple as that. I'm oversimplifying. But Russia had a lot of money saved up because Putin knew there would be sanctions placed on his country. But here's an article from Business Insider. The Russian economy is much worse than it appears, as Moscow's data is a collection of lies and distortions, according to economists. So nobody knows how bad the Russian economy is doing right now. I think everyone in Russia is lying to their government. The government gets the fake numbers, and then they lie some more when reporting it to the international community. So all the numbers coming out of Russia's central bank that they're reporting to the IMF and the World Bank, they're all fake, saying their economy this year is only going to contract by 1%. We don't know. Uh, we don't know, but when the economic collapse comes, when the money runs out, it'll hit hard, it'll hit fast, and panic amongst the population will set in, and there's nothing Putin can do to reverse it. Next question, can you talk more about Russia's nuclear weapons? In the upcoming Russian Civil War, if an armed group like the Chechens took over a Russian nuclear weapons facility or multiple facilities, could they actually use the weapons? Or do they need some kind of launch codes from Moscow? Keep up the good work. I really enjoy watching your channel. Greetings from Bulgaria. Glory to Ukraine. Uh, so you, for those who don't know, I was a nuclear and missile operations officer in the United States Air Force for six years. I understand perfectly how nuclear weapons work. Unfortunately, that's classified, and even though I'm no longer serving, I signed a piece of paper saying for the rest of my life I wouldn't talk about it. So I can't get into specifics, but I do want to let you guys know that Russia's nuclear weapons are very similar to the United States. One, because the Russians just copied everything we did. But two, especially during the 1970s, American engineers and scientists shared safety designs with the Soviets. We found ways to improve our weapons to make them safer to store and operate. And there's no reason to keep that a secret. If it just makes weapons safer, go ahead and share that information with the Soviets so they can steal that design. So I do know what safety precautions are in place regarding nuclear weapons. If the Wagner Group or the Chechens or some kind of rebel organization got their hands on nuclear weapons, well, they're not launching anything without enable codes for, for example, an ICBM. But as far as the actual warhead, once they have that, I mean, they could jerry-rig it to do whatever they want. Uh, you could take the fissile material out and make a dirty bomb. It's a nightmare scenario that I know people in the West are already planning for. Should the Kremlin, should Putin regimes collapse? Yeah, Russia's got about 6,000 6, of these nuclear warheads everywhere. On trains, on boats, road mobiles, in silos. The Russians are insane for doing this in the first place, but the entire world uh, is going to be at risk and is going to have to uh, participate in preventing all these weapons from falling into the hands of terrorist groups. China is going to have to help. China is going to have to get involved in order to secure some of these nuclear sites should the Russian government collapse. 
sorry, I don't really have an answer for you guys. That's just a dark scenario that the world is going to have to live with soon. What's your view on the war fatigue in the United States? Do people understand the needs for a long-term support? I don't think Americans are experiencing war fatigue because day-to-day, Americans are not paying attention to the war in Ukraine. It's no longer news as far as the cable news shows. Only when something big happens, like the Cursed Strait Bridge being bombed, that will make the news. But day-to-day, Americans, I'm sorry, are not thinking about the war in Ukraine. Yes, if you watch my channel, yes, if you go on to YouTube for daily updates, you are paying attention, but I don't think people in the United States are experiencing fatigue because we're kind of distracted. Trump calls for Supreme Court to intercede against Biden after his third indictment, so former President Trump is running for the Republican nomination in order to challenge President Biden next November. He's under investigation for a lot of things, Uh, and day-to-day this is uh, driving cable news. But when you poll Americans, they generally support Ukraine. The wording in the poll is very important. If, If you ask Americans, do you want to continue militarily supporting Ukraine, the majority of Americans say yes. But if you phrase the question as, do you want Congress to spend money to continue supporting Ukraine, people don't like Congress, people don't like Congress spending money, that's why this CNN poll that came out a couple days ago says, majority of Americans oppose more U.S. aid for Ukraine. It's up to Congress for decide. We live in a republic. These people represent the people. And they have all the information they know best. There is going to be another vote to militarily fund Ukraine for another year. It's going to happen in September or October. There's really only one person who matters, and that's Speaker of the House McCarthy. As long as he schedules a vote, he doesn't even have to vote for it. But as long as he schedules a vote, there will be enough members from both parties to continue funding Ukraine war efforts for another year. And... As of right now, I'm, I'm very confident that this vote will occur. Uh, military aid for Ukraine will continue through the rest of 2024. And uh, we'll, see, we'll see what people think uh, when the money runs out in October of 2024. What new countries will result from the possible collapse of the Russian Federation? And I honestly can't speak on this. I personally don't know enough about Russia's history, their geography, and their cultural and ethnic divides to speculate on what a future map would look like. When you just Google potential map of Russian breakup, this map looks pretty good and don't see a problem with that. I definitely think Moscow and St. Petersburg uh, need to decolonize their empire. The natural resources of Siberia the oil and gas fields, don't benefit the people in this region at all. All of that money and wealth goes to the oligarchs in Moscow and St. Petersburg. So there's going to be a divide where Russia's wealth and resources are going to end up in new countries. And the oligarchs of Moscow and St. Petersburg are going to be detached from their nice revenue streams. This isn't going to go well. This is what's going to cause the civil war. These people and these regions are going to be fighting each other for the natural resources, the oil and gas fields. I don't know. I don't know what's going to look like, but it's going to matter on powerful and influential individuals striking deals with each other, moving money around when new lines are drawn. It's going to be about the power players, probably more than the people. Next question, what would a most likely recapture scenario of Crimea look like? Ukraine could force the Russian troops to retreat by cutting off all supply lines and attacking infrastructure. Is that a possible scenario? Or would that type of strategy not be an option given the potential impact on the civilian population? 
So as soon as Ukraine reaches the Sea of Azov, they liberate Mariupol, Berdansk, and Melitopol. Russia basically will have retreated all of their military forces to Crimea. And Crimea itself, after nine years of Russian occupation, is basically just one giant military base. Russia, the last nine years, has done everything to militarize the peninsula. So there's actually a fantastic interactive map uh, made by somebody. I saw this article on Radio Free Europe showing all of the military installations on the Crimean Peninsula. So my advice to any civilians is stay away from these, because as soon as uh, the Ukrainian military is, is closer, uh, every valid military target on Crimea is going to get destroyed. I don't know if Russia is going to be trying to negotiate a settlement or a peace or begging for the war to stop so they can hold on to Crimea. I don't think Ukraine's going to go for it. If any Russian civilians want to leave this peninsula, Ukraine will allow that. But as far as Russia trying to resupply military aid or, for some reason, bring more people to the peninsula, Ukraine's not going to allow that. This might be a drawn-out process, getting Russia to give up on this peninsula getting all of Russia's military forces to abandon the peninsula. But it's, Russia's not going to be able to keep Crimea. After everything they've done, uh, everything they probably still intend to do, if they can somehow be rewarded for their aggression, not going to happen. Next question. The counteroffensive is taking longer than first thought due to heavy mining. If Ukraine can't regain territories including Crimea, in the next 18 months, what do you think will happen if a Republican wins in 2024? Well, first thing I want to state is there are numerous Republicans in the Republican primary who support Ukraine. Vice President, former Vice President Mike Pence, Governor Chris Christie, uh, there's a couple other strong Republican candidates who all support additional aid and, and military support for Ukraine. So when we talk about Republican, are we talking about Trump? And we don't really know. But I argue there's no way that Russia can hold on for another 18 months, given that uh, Prigozhin confirmed when he captured the Southern Military District Office, Russia is sustaining over 1,000 casualties a day, both killed and wounded. And the next president of the United States, uh, the election is uh, November of 2024, but the new president won't be sworn in until January 20th of 2025. That's 532 days. That's an additional half a million casualties for the Russian military if they don't give up on this war. I think something big will happen before then that could potentially change the course of this war, and Russia is having a presidential election in March of 2024. I think Prigozhin stood down his rebellion because the FSB told him just to wait for the presidential election. Prigozhin might not be running, but he could be brought into a new coalition government as the new Minister of Defense. I think the FSB knows that Putin can no longer effectively lead the Russian nation, given he's an internationally wanted war criminal by The Hague. He can't attend summits. He can't travel abroad. Putin is also just getting older. Uh, how much longer do they really want to hold on to this guy, given he's already in his 70s? So I think something is going to happen in March of 2024, and Putin probably will be replaced. What will happen then? I don't know. I think the FSB is the one running the Kremlin at this point. Since late 2022, we've received reports from both Ukrainian and other Western sources indicating that Russia is facing severe resource shortages, including ammunition, tanks, soldiers, and precision missiles. Surprisingly, despite their shortages, Russia continues to waste resources. 
I argue this on the channel, every time Russia uses a long-range weapon to bomb a church or an apartment building, they're not attacking the Ukrainian military. It's, it's a waste of resources. How close is Russia to critical resource depletion? When can we expect to witness their front lines collapsing as a consequence of these shortages? The unsatisfying answer is nobody knows. Uh, nobody knows how deep these old Soviet stockpiles being pulled out of deep storage really go. Yes, we have satellite images of various uh, holding areas for Russian armor. We can count those with satellites and we can see them depleting. But as far as what is stored in bunkers currently being pulled out, we don't know. We don't know when that's going to run out. But there are lots of indications that Russia is running low on a lot of stuff, pulling out T-54s and T-55s and sending them to the front lines, pulling out World War II era artillery pieces. It's indisputable that Russia is losing and expending more resources every month than they can produce domestically. They're firing more artillery than they can manufacture, they're losing more tanks, they're, they're firing more missiles than they can produce. This is part of the reason why two weeks ago Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu traveled to North Korea in person to kowtow to Kim Jong-un begging for artillery. What specifically was discussed, I'm sure there's people in the Kremlin leaking this intel to Western intelligence, but we know the Russians are desperate if uh, they're willing to send Shoigu to Kim Jong-un to ask for weapons. Next question, how prepared do you think the United States is for cyber warfare with China and Russia? There's been a lot of talk about our infrastructure, such as the power grid being extremely vulnerable to foreign hackers, and I'd like to know whether you think we can defend ourselves against such an attack. No. The United States is horribly unprepared for cyber warfare from Russia and China. So here's a recent article. Aggressive China cyber attacks are the defining threat of our time, according to a top U.S. cyber official. So why is our security and infrastructure against cyber attacks in the United States so terrible? And it's because of federalism. In other countries, Parliament is supreme, and they can pass a law, and they can fix and change things. Here in the United States, the federal government shares power with the states. The states share power with local governments, so when you want to get everybody on the same page to protect everyone from Chinese or Russian cyber attacks, this is a bureaucratic and legal nightmare as far as getting everyone to unify and standardize. In general, states and local governments, private companies, are just very skeptical of the federal government. If the federal government tried to pass a law saying everyone needs to do this to protect themselves from cyber attacks, people would challenge it, people would take it to court, people would complain, so... Nothing's going to get fixed in the United States until something catastrophic occurs. But we do have really good private security. Uh, there's lots of great uh, private security companies that partner with local governments, partner with private companies to protect us. It's the best in the world, but it's the best in the world for people willing to pay for it. That's the difference. No questions that I can think of, Jake. I just want to say how much I appreciate your work on your videos. They're always a bit extra. Thank you and glory to Ukraine. Thank you so much, uh, Drogna, for being a channel member and uh, supporting the channel. Next question. Hey, Jake, going from an English teacher in Korea to a nuclear missile officer makes me ask what moved you to join the Air Force, and in particular, the nuclear missile side of it. So for those who don't know, after graduating college, I went to South Korea for six years teaching English. 
And I loved the country, I loved the culture, I loved the people. I just wasn't crazy about being an English teacher for the rest of my life. I didn't want to do ESL anymore. So I was looking for what would be a good job where I could continue living in South Korea or continue living as an American, maybe somewhere in Asia. So I was thinking about being a foreign service officer. This is with the U.S. State Department. These are people who work in consulates or embassies in foreign countries. This was kind of my dream job once I figured out what it was. I did apply, but it's just super competitive. I think like 10,000 people a year apply and only 300 or 400 uh, actually get a job with the State Department. And I knew, given my education background and my life experience, I just wasn't a competitive candidate. Might be crazy for you guys to hear that, given my success in the Air Force and YouTube, but in 2015, I just was never going to get this job. But I did notice on the application uh, for your candidate profile score, you automatically get more points if you're a veteran. That's what gave me the first idea to apply to the Air Force, go to Maxwell Air Force Base and commission as an officer. I also thought it was appealing because if you join the military, you get the GI Bill. I wanted to earn a master's degree, but I didn't want to pay for it. So I ended up joining the Air Force at age 32 to get the GI Bill and to gain life experience to apply to the State Department. Four years later, I started experiencing success here on YouTube, and I kind of gave up on this uh, life path, but no complaints. YouTube has been fantastic for me. Next question, why can't the United States provide a fraction of their 2200 Attackums missiles or maybe AGM-158 cruise missiles? I know the U.S. Army and the United States Marine Corps are playing catch-up on procurement of missiles in the 150 to 500 kilometer range. But really? We can't even give Ukraine 50? There still seems to be an unwarranted fear of escalation. So anytime you hear in a news article or from the United States government a fear of escalation, I don't actually think that's the real reason. The United States uh, is currently giving or selling Attackums missiles to Australia. This article is from August 2nd. So we're not too concerned about our existing stockpile. But giving these Attackums to Australia would benefit the United States should a conflict erupt with China. The United States, yes, they want to help Ukraine. Yes, they want to help the Europeans uh, against the Russian threat. But I think as far as the big brass of the Pentagon... They think China is the bigger long-term threat. And if a war breaks out in the Pacific, uh, obviously the United States has lots of allies in the region, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, the Philippines, Australia. I, I don't think the United States thinks that Europe is going to help. If China gets into a hot war, they try to invade the island of Taiwan, and the United States gears up, I don't think the United States thinks the Europeans are going to help. When Macron of France went to China and publicly declared France wouldn't even participate in economic sanctions should try China try to invade Taiwan. This is why the United States is being defensive and selfish and they don't want to give up these attackums. But I also think it has to do with GLSDB arriving soon. So this article is the last we heard about GLSDB. The Pentagon made a statement in June. Ground launch small diameter bombs will make their debut come this fall. Boeing and Saab signed the contracts in February. The money was allocated. They're being produced now. They were supposed to show up this summer. Now Boeing and Saab is saying this fall. It's August 7th. I think these could start appearing uh, thousands of them could be appearing uh, in September. So if you don't know what this is, the United States has a lot of these uh, small diameter bombs. 
and they have a lot of these rocket motors in storage. And Boeing and Saab said for $50,000 a unit, we'll build this uh, connector piece and put them together, together and add a GPS glide kit. These can be fired from M270 and HIMARS. Ukraine has plenty of launchers. They just need something to launch. The United States can only produce so many Gimlers each month, and once GLSDB arrives, Ukraine's going to be firing hundreds of these things a day, potentially. It's going to be devastating for the Russian forces. I think they've got a 150-kilometer range, so the United States is saying, why would we send an a million, a million dollar attackums uh, that can go 300 kilometers when, when these are pretty good, they're significantly cheaper, and they're arriving soon. Additionally, Lockheed Martin is just not producing any more Attackums. Production ended uh, because the next generation PRISM, PRSM, Precision Strike Missile, uh, Lockheed Martin is beginning the production of those starting in 2024. Complicated answer. In my opinion, it's just a bunch of excuses. There's no reason the United States couldn't provide 50 or 100. I'm just giving you the reasons that I think, uh, I think the Pentagon is taking into consideration. All right, that's all the questions we got for this Q&A. Thank you to everyone who submitted a question or read other people's questions. Thank you for watching my videos and supporting my channel. It means the world to me. This is a dream come true that all I have to think about and do in a day is make YouTube videos for you guys. All right, that's all for this video. Thank you for watching. Uh, until the next one, take care.